Hello and welcome to episode 293 of Fergo on the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at AndrewRLP. And join me as always is the glorious League Freak. You can also find me on Twitter at League Freak. How you going there, mate? I'm pretty good, Andrew. How are you? Not too bad, not too bad. I mean, obviously we're both in a bit of a somber mood. Mm-hmm. Because, um, I mean, if you didn't know, um, tragic news today that uh, Rugby League legend... Tommy Rodonik has passed away. Uh, cancer finally got to him. And I say finally because he's been fighting for a long time and putting in a bloody mighty effort. And I think he got close to beating it several times. Mm. Um, but it just, I think he'd had too much chemotherapy along the way and his body just wasn't strong enough to be able to fight it anymore. But he's, yeah, he's fought it for a long, long time. As yeah, and it, he never, like, wanted sympathy about it. He just sort of was like, yeah, I'm dealing with this, and then would want to talk about footy. Um, and, you know, it, it's uh, he was such an awesome character, I think an underrated player too. I think a, a lot of people don't realise how good he actually was. Oh, yeah, unbelievable. And I think the one word... If you ever wanted to describe him as a football player, is competitive, and I'm not saying that like every other player is. Um, you know, he's said in many, many interviews over the years that every time he got onto the field, he hated, like, physically hated anyone wearing the number seven jumper other than himself, <laughs> and that's how he approached it. There's, there's, there's been stories people have been recounting all day about him, but there's a classic one when he went on a. A tour, I think it was with Steve Mortimer, mm-hmm. and they were both playing for, might have been a New South Wales tour, or an Australian one, I can't remember, one of the two, and they had to share a room together, and the idea was that Tommy, being the older player, would help, you know, help out Mortimer. Instead, Tommy threw Mortimer's bags out the window, because he saw him as a threat. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, great. That's brilliant. I, I remember- bar. I remember my grandfather t- telling me, um, I can't even remember how he brought it up, but we were talking one day and he said, you know, when uh, Tommy Rodonkis, he was a tough player, and he said, then Peter Sterling comes along, and Peter Sterling's like this small player, got long blonde hair at the time, playing for a glamour club, and he said every time Tommy Rodonkis faced Peter Sterling, he just would belt the shit out of Peter Sterling. <laughs> he said it was it was crazy to watch. Oh, it's phenomenal. Uh, there's a quote here that he's uh, I found that he said to Fox Sports in 2019 about um, you know how he'd been handling with the cancer. Mm-hmm. And he said six months a year ago I was gone. The cancer had spread and got around my carotid artery. I've had cancer of the testicles, four bypasses, cancer of the vocal cords, cancer of the throat. This last one, they couldn't have any more radiation or chemotherapy. So you just had to write it out. Mm. And I was in 2019. Yeah. So he still gave it another two years. They just That's just typifies him so well. Even when something like cancer that, you know, can do people in pretty quickly. He fought that bastard for another two years. Yeah, yeah. It's tough. I think I, I, I think it was, uh, what do I mean, Brad Fittler I heard say today that he was surprised he, he wasn't older than he was because he'd fit so much into his life. And yeah. I thought that was that was pretty poignant. But, um, yeah, it's a very sad, sad to hear that news today. Um, but it was nice to see so many people celebrating uh, a great, you know, and it, it was so, so many different things. I mean, I saw somebody put up um, when Wests had made the finals in the 90s under Tommy Rodonikas's coaching, and uh, I rem- and, and I watched it, and I remembered them taking the shot of the um, coach's box, which was a really weird coach's box. I think it was at Old Campbelltown Stadium. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, him just just absolutely going off when it was clear they were making the finals. And uh, so many, like, amazing moments he was involved in as a player and as a coach and as a former player. Like, he, it's just uh, a proper legend of the game. Oh, yeah. An unbelievable personality. Mm. Unbelievable um, tenacity on the field. 
brilliantly skilled. He wasn't just a rugged player. He was brilliantly skilled and, you know, played as a small guy in possibly the roughest, hardest era in rugby league in Australia, which is the 70s. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, accomplished everything a, a player could, you know, played for played for state, played a lot of tests. Uh, phenomenal player, absolute legend of a human. Um, my wife and I actually met him and Arthur Beeson in Newcastle one day. We went up there for a, a holiday, mm-hmm. got off the plane, and there's there's Artie and, and Tommy just sitting outside waiting for a taxi. Mm-hmm. And I used to work at the Roosters Leagues Club, and... Um, this is back when Beeson was doing some uh, assistant coaching there. Yeah. And at the end of every training session, you know, I think it was every Wednesday or Thursday or something like that when I was working, they'd always come inside. This is when Ricky Stewart was coaching. They, they'd come into the building and they'd go upstairs to have their, you know, strategy meetings or whatever else. And everyone would walk all the way through pasture. They wouldn't say anything. Arnie would always say good day to everyone. Yeah. Like if you walk past, you'd say good day and shake your hand. And I used to always make sure that – when it was around the time they'd be coming in, I'd always be lingering around the door somewhere so I could always <laughs> say good day to Artie, and he'd always shake my hand and say, "Hey, you go, mate, no worries. And, we... <laughs> and it was two years later after I'd left that job that we saw him at the airport, and mm-hmm. he, he gave me that look that said, I know you. Mm. I know you. And he gave me a look and a little bit of a smile. And the missus goes, is that Arthur Beast? And I went, yeah, yeah, go say good day. He's, he's easy to approach. She's like, Really? Went, yeah, yeah. So she turned and says, how you going? Like, yeah, no worries. I had a bit of a chat and everything. And Tommy's getting involved in the chat. And it's just, um, you know, fantastic humans. It's just so easy to approach. And if you didn't know that they were footballing legends, yeah. it would not It would not have mattered one iota. They just like chatting with everybody. Yeah, yeah. Friendly, approachable, absolutely um, generous, magnificent human beings. The, the world is poorer without either of them being around anymore. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. So, here's to Tommy, and uh, yeah, we won't linger up too much more. There's been lots of great stuff being said uh, in articles and on, you know, TV shows and stuff like that. We recommend you go check out as much of that as you can if you want to find out about it because it's all positive and it's all great about Tommy. Um, and one thing I've noticed with a lot of it is how much he talks about Arthur Beetson. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, massive respect he's got for, for Artie, and rightfully so. They'll already be hanging out together upstairs. Oh, yeah. They can both get drink and smoke to their heart's content. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure they will be. Um, now we're to other news. Yep. Um, well, the first thing that's come up here uh, uh, that I wanted to quickly look at was the Adam Reynolds deal with South. Yeah, it's just a weird one, hey? Yeah. Now, I think Reynolds is trying to get a three-year deal. He's 31. Mm-hmm. So he's looking at getting, essentially, his last big deal, and he wants to make it a decent-sized one. Fair enough. And South have offered him a two-year deal where, it, well, it's essentially a one-year deal, but a second year in the club's favour. Mm-hmm. And it's seven hundred thousand dollars each year. First question I've got for you: Do you think Adam Reynolds is worth seven hundred thousand dollars per season? I do. Yeah, he's a premiership winning halfback, and you know, you you look around the halfbacks in the league. There's not too many of them that are proven when it counts, and there's also not too many of them that have the experience. And on top of that, like he, he can guide your team around like he is a big difference to South Sydney and he's somebody that I think could make a difference at a lot of clubs so yeah I do think he's worth that I fully agree I think that he's um, even for the first two years I think he's still worth a million dollars a year for the first two years minimum he's got to be very very close because like you know how many halfbacks in the NRL could you honestly say that if they're fit and healthy in the final series that you are 100% confident they can get the job done. Mm. And it is very, very, very few. So, like, if you look at that value on a player, I I couldn't, if any club decided to go and pay him a million bucks a year, I couldn't argue with it. No. 
And he's the sort of halfback that you can put anyone you want in the six jumper next to him. You'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, brilliant goal kicker as well. And there's so many clubs you think if he went there, they would be a million times better too. Like yeah. I, 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 whenever I watch the Canberra Raiders play, I always think, man, if their halfback was Adam Reynolds, I don't want to play this Canberra team. No, that's right. I mean, his his general general play kicking is, you know, one of the best out there. Um, pretty handy running game. Very very good passing game. Uh, just consistent as hell. You just don't see him have bad games. And like. It's not as though you're looking at him and physically seeing a player that looks like he's slowing down. Like, he just doesn't look like that at all. No, that's right. But, you know, if Souths feel like they want to get out too early rather than too late, that's up to them. But, man, they'd want to have a pretty damn good replacement for him. That's the next one. Is like, who are they going to get in to replace him? Mm. And the other thing I can think of is Wayne Bennett would be using, you know, his connections in Brisbane to probably try and get Tom Dearden down. He's got a fair few, you know, he's a fair bit of a track record of, of getting Broncos players down to whatever club he's at. Yeah, but, like, I mean, today Wayne Bennett was pretty vocal in coming out and saying he's definitely gone at the end of the year and that he's moving back to Brisbane. He said he's not going to coach the Broncos again and that he kind of is open to coaching that second Brisbane team. So I found all of that interesting, like the whole lot of it. Um, well, that's interesting because, I mean, no, I suppose that's the thing. We haven't heard anything from Craig Bellamy, but what if the new Brisbane team gets up and they've got to choose between Craig Bellamy or Wayne Bennett? I, I don't know. I'm picking Bellamy. Oh, 100%, yeah. I'll pick Bellamy every so, day. Well, Wayne Bennett's just going to disappear into the night. Well, that's something Wayne Bennett's going to have to think about, hey. And, like, you know, if he puts that out there that he'd be open to coaching that second Brisbane team, that's that's a, a big weight on that second Brisbane team to start up the new club and then say, no, 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 we're not having Wayne Bennett, we're going with Craig Bellamy. But it's the way that you would go. I mean, Bellamy's going to do the whole top to bottom of the club, whereas I think Wayne Bennett... You, you know, how long is he going to be there for? You know, is he, is he going to say it is his club? Like, Bellamy is going to go there and be like, this is my team. This is my club. And I'm going to make sure every single thing runs the way I want it to. And that's what you want at a new club is direction. So, you know, it, it's going to be an interesting one. If you have to choose between the two, it's not a bad choice, eh? It's, it really isn't. <laughs> Both are really, really good at building a club from juniors all the way through. Um, I'd say Bellamy's a lot better at talent identification than, than Bennett now, though. And that's going to be something that I think the new team's going to want. Plus, they're probably going to want a coach they can hang on to for about 10 years, whereas mm. Bennett's probably thinking about retiring pretty soon anyway. Okay, I've got a question for you. Do you think Wayne Bennett knows a whole lot more about these situations? And he knows that he's going to end up as the coach of the second Brisbane team and Bellamy is eventually going to coach the Broncos. So he doesn't have to worry about saying anything about Bellamy going to that second Brisbane team. Mm. Hadn't thought about Bellamy going to the Broncos. Mm. It's probably not a, a great idea for, for the Broncos. Yeah, it'd be great. And, you know, that second Brisbane team, they got Bennett, they, that'd be fine as well. But mm. I just thought it was interesting. He put his name out there. It didn't feel like a Wayne Bennett thing to do. No, that's for sure. Unless, of course, he might... might oh, I don't know. Would, would North Queensland be too far for him to travel? Oh, man. I feel like it would be, hey? Yeah. Mind you, in saying that, I'm I'm fine with the Cowboys sticking with Peyton. I think he's he's, he's capable of turning them around. Um, I think I don't think he's worried at all about them getting a wooden spoon if that happens, because mm-hmm. it might be the kick in the ass that he feels that side needs and that club needs. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm fine with him being there. So, yeah, I wonder, it's interesting. 
I wonder if you had to see both coaches down, and, and more for, thinking of it from uh, Bellamy's point of view, I wonder if he would rather sit down with a blank sheet of paper and say, all right, these are the players we're going to target. He's going to miss some of them players. They're going to get some of them players. He's going to have to bring in players that are development players, things like that. Would he rather that scenario? Or would he rather go into a known scenario like he would at the Broncos where, you know, you can't pick and choose who you want, but you know what's there. You know what you're getting into. Um, I reckon Bellamy would be much more comfortable going from scratch because he he kind of did that at the Storm. Yeah. He set up those, um, you know, feeder clubs in Queensland. Mm Mm-hmm. You had to actually start up a, a, you know, a New South Wales Cup team in in Melbourne as well. You know, well, not he on his own, but you know, he was at the club when that happened, and he was definitely trying to do all the right things about trying to, you know, get the development in Melbourne and getting local local talent from Melbourne actually playing reserve grade footy in the hope he could bring them through to the to the top side. Yeah. So I think that's more of what he's he likes doing. He likes the running the whole the whole scheme of things. Mm. Um, I think Bennett's become more of a mentor slash coach. You know, the same sort of thing that Melman Inc. Was, was doing at the, the Queensland team when he was coaching there. Yeah. So I think he kind of needs something that's set up. Yeah, and he would need... Uh, he, he would need, like he's done at South, to be able to go into the role and say, okay, look, I'm going to be here for three years. But after that three years, this guy's taken over. Mm. And, uh, you know, i that's not an ideal scenario for a new club. That's for sure. No, that's right. You want to have someone that you can just lock down and go, right, that job's sorted. We don't need to worry about it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it is interesting, though. It is very interesting. Can um, we talk about the gymnastics that happened again at NRL headquarters today? We We need to. Yeah. We need to. Can, can I start with, this all began when Phil Gould came out and said he thinks the NYC should come back. Yeah, now you found a tweet by him where... No, he, it was an article. Was it a whole article? An article he wrote. Okay. And he's saying eight years ago, this is back in 2013, the NYC must take a step back for the game to go forward. And the article was about how what he thinks should have happened from the get-go was that the the New South Wales Cup should have been the competition that got all of the promotion and television and stuff like that. And that should have been seen as, you know, the genuine second-grade com- uh, competition, the, the step from there into the NRL. Mm-hmm. But instead it was the NYC that got that push. And so he thinks that that sort of cannibalised the New South Wales Cup. I dare say is what he was getting at. Mm. So he wasn't... The article I found wasn't him saying, we need to scrap it. He was just saying, we need to push it back in order to try and get the you know, the structure in place properly. Um, the problem is, though, by taking the spotlight off the NYC and not having it televised it became a financial liability and therefore it got scrapped. Yeah. And like, I remember when this happened, cause it was at Penrith when this happened and I'm watching the NYC produce like players that were ready to step into first grade, not all of them, but a hell of a lot of them. And a lot of the star players that like, you know, the NYC turned out amazing names, absolutely amazing names. And so I remember when Phil Gould came out and said that, and I'm like, why would you mess with something that's working so well? And especially when the idea is that, like, you want to make reserve grade, reserve grade, which it always was, and you kind of wanted to take the spotlight off of something that was working. And to me, it just seemed like a rugby league thing. You know, it's the NRL is the be all and end all. And, you know, when something else takes any of the spotlight, we've got to kill that off. Got to get rid of that. You've got to be making 50 million bucks a game like state of origin for rugby league clubs to be willing to put up with you. And so, and he started the the momentum 
to get the NYC scrapped. And I couldn't believe they did it. Like, why would you build something to scrap it? And so for him to turn around and say that it was a bad idea, it's like, it's just more proof we need to stop listening to people like Phil Gould. And the fact that Peter Volandis is coming out and he's like, well, I think the way to stop these blowouts in the games for all the rules that he just pulled out of his arse in the offseason is to bring back the NYC. I don't understand how that works either. It just seems like a bunch of reactionary idiots that are running the game at the moment, and they're changing rules now on a weekly basis. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and, and now it's not just rules. It's it's now the structure of the grassroots structure of the game. Yeah. it's It baffles me how, you know, the fans can come out and say, this is what we want. This is what we don't want. This is what we like, what we don't like. And Peter Vlandy's like, who cares about those fucking idiots? Mm-hmm. And then when a fucking idiot comes up and says, we should do this and we should do that, they go, oh, that's a good idea. Let's do that. Let's do this. And all these fucking journos coming out with their bullshit ideas that worked back in the 70s. Yeah, and, like, they've got Peter Volandis chasing his tail. Yeah. It's, it's bloody incredible to see. And, you know, the players now are coming out and saying these new rules are ridiculous. They're killing us. Coaches apparently don't like them, which coaches are never going to like rule changes. No. Um, unless they, you know, favour their club. But it it's just, you know, at what point... It's supposed to be a sport. Like, the rules are in place, and we all play by those rules. It shouldn't be something that just is changed on whims. Like, the two-point field goal thing from 40 metres out is just a bullshit rule that was pulled out of someone's ass for the reason of pulling it out of someone's ass. It's the same thing for the 2040 rule, which hasn't been used once not even once. It's docile. Yeah. It's docile shit. Look, there's a few things, okay? Then this is why independent content creators are absolutely fucking awesome. You should try and follow as many of them as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the Rugby League Eye Test on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's a few others. I'll try and find them all. Pythagorum and, NRL. Pythagorum NRL. Uh, Pythagorum. Love him. He's fucking brilliant. Yep. Um, I think the Cumberland throw. Mm-hmm. There's there's a few others as well. And Leaguefreak.com. <laughs> chuck that in there too. But what a lot of them have done with their analysis is they've found that the game isn't actually faster. Mm-hmm. What it is is busier. Yeah. And there is a difference. And it means that there's a little bit more panic going on now. And the teams that are a little bit more composed are absolutely destroying the teams that are a bit more panicky. Mm-hmm. And we are seeing margins blowing out. Okay, so the winning margins in in from twenty thirteen to twenty nineteen had, with the exception of one season, but even that was more of a plateauy sort of thing, have largely been going down. So the games have been getting closer. Yeah, in that period there, and then we had a whole heap of rule changes come in for 2020 and the average margin went up to where it was around 2011. Mm-hmm. And then this year it's now at the highest it's ever been currently. This is the winning margin. So this is not in, so you, I'm not including draws in this. This is only looking at the winning margin. Mm-hmm. It's now out to the highest it's ever been in the history of the game after four rounds. Yeah. And like we are seeing teams, if you, if you give away a six again, and the referees, you got to remember, are controlling this, like, chaotic game that's happening at the moment. And so they're being run off their feet. And the six again calls, I think, are inconsistent. And I understand why. There's only one referee on the field. And, like, I look at a team, and it's why the Panthers are so good. They just grind you into the dust. Like, they, as you say, it's about composure. And so the teams that can just get through their sets and, you know, have good defense, they're going to absolutely murder you for the most part. That and there's not many me. teams that can do that. It's yeah. like the Panthers, the Storm. I, I don't even think the Bunnies you can put in there just yet. Like their defense isn't on the same level as those two, those two teams. It's uh, And th- it's all from rule changes that were made on a whim. It's not like they were, you looked at... Um, patterns in results or anything and said, well, we've got to bring this in. 
this has been a long-term trend. We definitely have to change this. Like, it's just made up, just out of nowhere. Yeah. This is it. Like, the average margin in 2019, so look on here, was around, was just under 14 points per game. Mm-hmm. Okay, which was, I think it's only been there about, let's see, one, two, I don't know, maybe half a dozen times since 1990. Mm-hmm. So it was, and it got down to a good point. And 2020, it jumped up to just over 15 points a game. Mm-hmm. And it's currently sitting at just over 18 points a game. So it's jumped up three points a game, which is the and highest it's ever jumped up in, in since... Remember that crazy period where we we, st- we finally got the ten meter rule put in place, yeah. and that sorted out the the fit teams from the from the nineteen eighties teams. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we saw a bunch of blowouts ninety two, ninety three, ninety four. Um, That's weird. I was thinking about this the other day. It, like that, if you take say the nineteen eighty seven premiers, and you play them against the 1992 premiers. There's not a big jump. No. That, I reckon they get flogged. I, I, I think the, the 92 comp, I mean, everyone remembers, that's the year the Broncos were largely untouchable. Mm. The games were, like that season, it had the tightest season since 1990. But the yeah. average margin was under 12 points a game. That's winning margin was under 12 points a game. Well, there were so many good teams at that that point yeah. in games history too, like you, well, you, know, you had it, Penrith, who were still a very strong team. They they had a lot of stuff that went on off the field, which hampered there. Um, you also had Canberra, which were, but you know, they they were languishing only because they had to cut a whole heap of players after they they cheated the cap. Mm-hmm. They still had the bones of a very strong team, which. It's evident because two years later they won the premiership. Yeah. The Bulldogs were building, rebuilding again. Manly was rebuilding again, um, and strong. Norse was strong. Um, you know, there's just so many teams that were that were very, very competitive and very tough, and so the competition was pretty close. Yeah, and then things started to blow out a bit. The margins were massive, ninety four, ninety five, but they were just under eighteen points a game. So there weren't even when we saw those blowouts when the new teams came in in the comp. That that competition was closer than one of what we've got right now. It's crazy. Yeah, it's never been this bad. This crazy. And, and like uh, you look at the, I know when I tip games, there's certain games this season especially, and the season's only young, but where you're like, oh, that that team has no hope. Like I think the the Cowboys play the Tigers this week, mm-hmm. and I'm like. Tigers going to whip them. Well, based on form, they should. Yeah. Who knows that? I mean, this is the thing. It's the second worst defensive team versus the third worst defensive team. But, but yeah, but even so, like the Tigers, they should score 30 points against the Cowboys. Like there's a, another game, the Storm versus Bulldogs. If the Storm don't score 40 points, they should be disgusted with themselves. <laughs> You know, the Warriors, who have been decimated by injuries, they should flog their shit out of Manly. Uh, the Rabbitohs are playing the Broncos. Now, the Broncos aren't that bad, but, man, the Rabbitohs should just rip them to shreds. And you just it just goes on and on through that when you're tipping games this season, and it's it's not a good thing. Like, you know, we've got three teams in our competition right now who are absolute no-hopers. And could get flogged every single week until they play one another. Well, let's let's look at that too, because those three teams are historically bad so far. Mm. Okay, so from 1908 till 2020, there had only been seven sides that had a points difference of minus 100 or worse after four rounds. So we had the university team of 1920 and 1921, the uni team in 1935, Canterbury 71, Balmain 74, Manly of 1999, and the Cowboys in 2002. Mm. Seven from 99 to 2020. We've got three this year. Yeah. 
that have done that. Cowboys minus 105, Canterbury minus 106, Manly minus 122. Manly have had the fourth worst start to a season ever when you look at it this way. It's insane. And they might not be the worst of the three. No, at the moment, looking at the way the the Cowboys' defence is functioning is atrocious. Yeah. And Canterbury's attack is pathetic. Yeah, Canterbury's attack is... Man, I mean, that's... They're starting to look like one of the worst attacking sides I've ever seen. Yeah. Like... The last, last time we've had a, they, I was going to say last, the last time we had a team that scored less than twenty points after four rounds was Balmain in seventy four, and the last time a team had scored less points than what the Bulldogs scored after four rounds was Glebe in nineteen twenty eight. For fuck's sake, jeez! And like <laughs> there were people that were posting like the half a dozen players that have scored more points individually than Canterbury this year. Yeah, it's it's uh. It's not good for the game, especially when you you know you think well. A couple of years ago, the game was, and that was a good thing. That's what the NRL hung its hat on. And I remember hearing like AFL types, and AFL is a bludger of a game, but AFL types saying, "Look, our competition is not cut close. The top teams and the bottom teams, it's just not close. And look at what the NRL's done. Every game you tune in, it could go either way." It's definitely not like that this season. Not at all. No. No, but apparently this is what you know, this is what Volandi's wanted. Apparently this is great for rugby league. And I know I've said in the previous episode, remember the last time we had lots of points being scored? Mm-hmm. It was around that 99-2003 period. The touch football era. Yeah. Don't people look back on that and go, oh, the glory days. Oh, no, they don't. That's right. Because it was shit. That's we my had, most hated era of rugby league I've ever watched, and it's not we, even close. So we had teams conceding over 700 points a season. Mm. That's that's fucking ridiculous. It really was. And, you know, the, the thought that you would look at that and say, you know what, that's what the fans want. Yeah, like throughout the, the 90s and even now, if a team concedes 600 points in a year, they are very close to getting the wooden spoon. Mm-hmm. You look at the 2001 ladder. The Knights who finished third conceded 639 points, and they had a points differential of plus 143. That's insane. <laughs> the Warriors were eighth. They conceded 629 points. Melbourne were ninth. They conceded 725. Whoa. The Northern Eagles conceded 750. The West Tigers, 746. The Cowboys, 771. None of those teams finished last. Penrith were last that year. They conceded mm-hmm. 847 points. That's yeah. up there with what was some of the worst defence for an entire season ever. No one realises that because Penrith scored four 500 points of their own. Usually when a team comes last, they score bugger all points and concede a ton. Yeah. Penrith still scored a ton of points. Yeah, and look, that Penrith team was a bludger of a team, an absolute bludger of a team. Um. And the fact that they could score that many points is crazy. Yeah. Average points per game, 48.85. That's just ridiculous. And now we're going back to that. No one looks back on that period and goes, yeah, that was great football. They just don't. And now we're going back to it. I don't know why. And to make matters worse, we're finding out that, you know, there's lots of injuries coming from it. And this is going to go into lots of concussions. And another story, which yeah. is, there's, yeah, it's been reported that uh, Jake Friend is going to announce he's going to retire. Yeah, and he's made the right choice. He doesn't oh, need to abs- prove anything. Absolutely has. He's he's done everything he possibly can as a player in the game. Yeah. Um. The, you know, the thing I've been noticing watching these games is because players are getting run off their feet, their tackling techniques going out the window. And a lot of smaller players, they're getting their heads in the wrong place because they're, they're getting to a point and, it, you know, it's rugby league mentality of I just throw your body in front of the, the person, you know, just do your best. Mm-hmm. But their technique's going out the window because they're just run off their feet and it's not good for them physically. And we really are. Like, this is the first time I've really thought to myself, like, 
is the style of football what's causing this. A lot of times when you see the media carrying on about an injury crisis, it's a very short-term thing, and you sort of think, well, it's probably just a bit of bad luck for a lot of players. This is the first time I've really looked at it and thought, no, I, I really do think that this is the rule set we're working under. And the fact that they're having to bring in new bench policies and things like that mid-season, and like mid-season, we've been playing for a month. Like yeah. <laughs> the competition's brand new. Um, that yeah. says it all. It's nuts. I mean, that's the thing. It's, they're not realising it. Like now they've, <laughs> they're now bringing in an 18th interchange player. Like, <laughs> open your goddamn fucking eyes. Mm. You're not bringing it in because teams want to have an extra player. You're bringing it in because teams, you know, every single team are dealing with the same issue, and that is players are getting very tired. And when they get tired, their muscles are relaxing and they're getting injured a lot more. They're making slower decisions because they're tired. They're making poorer decisions because they're tired. And that is a recipe for injuries. Yeah. And, and that's not just that's not scientific. I mean, that's just a normal fact. You can get any sort of, you know, medical on. They will tell you this. They'll confirm this. And that's the risk we're running here. And possibly what they should be doing is say, you know what, if we're going to keep going with this faster version of the game, then perhaps we need to take the number of interchanges from ten up to twelve or up to fourteen or something like that. And that's. And I'm not saying that that's going to help fix things. It's mm. not. That's just going to help player welfare, and that's it. You're not going to fix yeah. the, the issue we've got at the game at the moment. The only way you but, can do that is you need to, first and foremost, you've got to get rid of the set restarts and just have penalties. Because yeah. that's a time to just stop, find touch. Everyone can just jog along. They get into position and you defend. It's a little pause in the game. Bring back scrums. Yeah. Okay. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just another period where everyone can stop, have a little rest. There was no no one was calling for scrums to be scrapped. No one. Let me rephrase that. No one with a fucking brain was calling for scrums to be scrapped. The only people calling for scrums to be scrapped were people going, well, they're not even pushing it anymore. Hang on. That's not the point of a scrum anymore. Yeah. You idiots. You know, and they're just little pauses. They're all very helpful. And they're parts of the game as well. Yeah. Like, you need to get a breather. So Look how many tries we've had from, you know, from you, set you, plays you, off scrums too. I mean, God, they're bloody great to watch, and here we are taking them away. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And, you know, you you get r- rugby league down to where it's just this running contest for 80 minutes. And guess what? Players are going to run themselves into the ground, and that's what we're seeing. Um, it's going to hurt the longevity of players' careers as well. That's another thing. It, it And... The idea that you could go into an off season where everything's fine with the sport and come up with like nearly a dozen rule changes and then not contemplate that there's going to be a cause and effect of those rule changes to the point where you're a month into the year and all of a sudden you're like, well, we've got to fundamentally change a rule of how many players you can name in a, in a squad. It's unbelievable that it, the game has got to this point. And we're at this point because the dude that's running it it just will change things on a whim. And we can't have that. And this is where I'd like to see the International Rugby League step up and say, hang on a second, Australia. You can't change the fucking rules of rugby league. That's not how it works. You know, even if it's just to put pressure on them, pressure them through the media. Because we've been having the NRL change the rules time and time again, and a lot of the rule changes have been good. But... When you get to a point where in the last 18 months, we've probably had like 22 rule changes. What the fuck? Yeah, it's insane. Like 2018, 2019, yeah, we had the game where it needed to be. Yep. Games were getting closer. Teams had more of a chance of making the finals. There's a little bit more of unpredictability (laughs) in each game in every round. That's exactly what you want. You could have all sorts of body types playing the game. Yeah. You could play different styles of rugby league and still win. See, this you is... Know, the, we're going to end up with teams full of second rollers. Sorry. What was that again? We're going to end up with teams full of second rollers. No, you I just, fully agree. It, you're just going to be running through, you know. You'll get your centres so that they can play in the second row as well. And, you, you know, I, I just... 
it needs to be changed back. Like, and the idea that it's going to be fixed by having a, you know, pr- another promoted under twenties competition. I hope they bring back the under twenties competition, but that's not going to stop blowout score lines under these rules. No, and they if they bring it back, they can't be using these rules either because they are just dire. Mm-hmm. Um, and to see so many fans, thankfully, starting to open their eyes and realise that not everything Landy's touches is gold. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully. I don't have any hopes, but, you know, hopefully some of that gets back into the, the media. Someone in the mainstream media gets the balls to actually report on the fact that, you know what, a lot of fans aren't happy with these rules and maybe Vlandis will do something about it then because he doesn't listen to the fans. He only listens to the to his mates in the media. Yeah, it's like a handful of old cronies. Yeah, who constantly, it's buddy, ridiculous. constantly rub his dick for him. That's all they're doing. Ugh. Maybe you can tell us how he used to tackle everything again in whatever fucking C grade competition he's playing down in Wollongong. Yeah. Fucking embarrassing. And, and unsuspecting orange boys. Yeah. Like that's a that's an easy target to me. <laughs> Look over the bloke on the sideline is not even playing footy. And like Phil Gould now <laughs> has to go into the same fucking basket as Matthew Johns. I think that's yeah. official now. Yeah, it's gotta be. Yeah. Anything Matthew John all over the says, place. you fucking ignore it. Yeah, do the opposite. Yeah. Um, what else has been going on? Uh, let me see. What else? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't think too much else is happening in rugby well, league. There was... Actually, there was something disgraceful. Okay. Horribly disgraceful. Despicable, even. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, yes. There's a video of plans roughing up the South mascot, Reggie the Rabbit. Mm. Horrible, horrible stuff. We watched um, it. We watched it. Uh, you know what? I'm disappointed that there was no actual warning put on the video. Because mm-hmm. I've got to say, I think, I think I'm mentally scarred. I'm not sure I can go to an NRL game anymore, <laughs> especially not as a mascot. Well, I tell you what, I've seen some videos in my time where people have done terrible things with a rabbit, but this is right up there. Oh, sorry, right. I thought you put something right up the rabbit. Um, yeah, no, th- this is horrible. I think, so what happened is if you watch the video, um, you see a few people hanging their finger at the rabbit, mm-hmm. and I think one of them might have pushed him. He didn't fall over. He just took a step back. Yeah. Um, so uh, thoughts and prayers to Reggie the Rabbit. Uh, hope, you know, hope you overcome this, mate. And, you know, I think it's only fair, and we've got a really good listener base. Put your rabbits out for Reggie. Mm. Rabbits out for Reggie. That's what we need. Get your bunnies out. Yeah. That's the way. Um yeah, apparently someone was telling some some dickhead to punch him again. I mean, let's be honest. How much how much of a fucker would you have to be to punch a mascot? Because, I mean, look at them. They're covered in a whole heap of padding. Mm-hmm. Punching them is rather pointless. Mike Tyson could punch that thing. It's not going to have any impact. Yeah, They're wrapped be in pillows. Be honest. Have you ever seen a mascot and just wanted to... Beat the shit out of them. No. Neither have I, actually. No. I love the mascots. <laughs> They're perfectly fine. Actually, you know, the only mascot that ever really probably put their fists up and deserved it was the Illawarra one. And I can't remember his name. Do you remember it? Oh, he had no. a motorcycle helmet for a head. He did, yes. And I'm pretty sure he used to get into some throwdowns. He reminds me of the Melbourne Storm one. No, you're thinking of Captain Charger. Remember Captain Charger at the Gold Coast? He no. he was off his fucking tits. <laughs> oh, the Melbourne Storm one, he, he gets a little soft plush toy. Yeah. That's like, you know, if, if they're playing the Broncos, he gets, he's got a little Bronco toy. 
Yeah. He rides around swinging around by the tail. Oh, really? And then he puts it down on the ground, and then he'll he's on a, like a, a quad bike, and then he runs over it on the quad bike. Yeah. And then he'll come out and he'll do this like backflip, you know, like a some sort of backflip wrestling flip thing, and jumps on top of it and smashes it and Are you kicks it about around the and chucks elbow? it around and stuff. Hey. Are you talking about the people's elbow? No, it looks like one of those um, swanton flip things. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's a rather athletic man. Do you remember when there was that season or two where the NRL made every team have mascots that looked like they were designed by somebody that had taken shitloads of LSD? Yeah, that was that was an interesting time. Mm, yeah. <laughs> we need to bring back mascot races. I, You know what? Of all of the things that happen at halftime, nothing beats mascot races. Everyone's into it. I, I remember watching some rather weird shit at uh, halftime when it might have been two a year or two after South came back in. Yeah. And they had, like, races for trying to win diuretics and fucking Not really. <laughs> dietary supplements and stuff like that. I mean, this yeah. is the weirdest shit I've seen. Like, a bunch of, you know girthy humans running the length of the field to win dietary products. I mean, there's some sick prick sitting there in the in the background going, yeah, this will be funny. <laughs> Let's just laugh at the fatties running to try and get a diet drink. They really had to wind back the halftime shows when Penrith started making people run at each other until somebody died. <laughs> like when, when, they, when they went full Thunderdome. Did they break their leg or something? Yeah, oh, fuck yeah. Shanta, he fucking, he didn't just break his leg, he pulverised it. <laughs> he, uh, yeah, poor, poor bastard. He, I, I think he still has problems with his leg. But, um, yeah, who would have thought that having people run from 50 metre run-ups wouldn't be an end poorly? <laughs> it's a great idea. See, what they should have now is just have goal-kicking competitions. That's See, the I safest thing to do. I say I don't like goal kicking competitions because no Maybe. one can. Very few people can kick a football, really. Well, that's that's the purpose, though. Like, we need to we need to do something with this twenty forty rule and these two point field goals, and they should just be used for <laughs> halftime entertainment. Because let's be honest, that's all they are. <laughs> what if if you can kick a forty meter field goal, that two points gets added to your team's there you go. total? That'd be pretty cool. That's pretty impressive. I reckon they should do that. If you can kick a twenty forty. Your team automatically gets a penalty at the start of play in the second <laughs> round. <laughs> Be like when you play the fucking Warriors. Exactly. <laughs> I keep seeing people saying that, um, and it's always idiots. Twitter's full of idiots. We all know that. But uh, people saying like, oh, it's the top teams have all been ordained by the NRL. It's like, I can't believe that people are still saying that shit. Yeah. Have um... you ever been around people that, like properly believe that the competition's rigged. Yeah, you know, I I have, and you know what the the amazing thing is mm. is that I point out to them that they sit there and constantly talk about how how stupid the NRL are, mm. and yet they come out with that going. You do realise how much intelligence is required to rig a competition <laughs> to favour a set number of teams every year. Yeah, you can't call them idiots if that's what they're doing. Like you got the- you got to pick one. Yeah. And the other thing is, like, do you understand how self-absorbed, self-important, self-involved rugby league people are? Like, the idea that any of them would say, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll consider my whole career on hold while we move towards this one goal so this team can win and not my team. Yeah, and if, I mean, look, and if that's the case, how come the Tigers are never allowed to win? <laughs> Everyone else has been allowed to play in the finals, not the Tigers. There should be some sort of like, uh, you know, board. We need to do a board where we've got like string going from one thing to another that shows how you get to who we will allow to win the premiership. Well, kind of like a uh, snakes and ladders thing. Yeah, I guess that'd work. Except every time the Tigers take a step, they just go down another snake. It's <laughs> just another snake. <laughs> That's all they do. Yeah. It's like, you think you're going better? Ah, uh, here's a snake. Here's, here's a snake. another one. Another snake. Yeah, go down another one. That's all they do. Mm. 
Um, right, well, is there anything else? I don't think there's anything else. No, that's it. We're going to do our next episode is going to be all emails. Unless something crazy happens, we're just going to read your emails and that will be it. So if you've got an email to send, and we've got a few ready to rock and roll, but if you've got an email that you've got in your head, send it now. You know where to send it. Absolutely. Um, and let's do a bit of a uh, a quick look at the leaderboard on the footy tipping. Yeah. I won't mention results. We're going to save that for the next episode. Y- yes. But on, on the leaderboard, mate, we've got Sarah Miller. He's at the top with 28. And, Killing uh, it, Sarah. Good stuff. He's smashing it. James Cunningham. Um, the old dickhead devil saw squirters. Uh, dickhead devil saw <laughs> Jeez. I, I, I don't know which one is his surname. Is it squirters or is it devil saw squirters? I'm not sure. He's going to uh, clarify that his, with No, no. I think his last name is Hat and his first name is Dick. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. And the rest is just his team name. Yeah. Fair yeah, enough. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's uh, how it comes up on my one anyway. Right, I see. I it's see. got his name underneath the team name. Oh, right. I get you. Yeah. Um, Steve Bell and Marksman Plays and Nadine are all on 26 with the Glorious League Freak. Yeah. Hang on, hang on. I'm up. This, on my one, it says different. Yeah, I'm just saying you're all on 26. Are we? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to say your name at the end of that list. Ah, oh, tips, yes. I see. I see yeah. what you've done here. Yeah. So this is the um, this is the toughest footy tipping competition there is. 100%. Yeah. There's another one which we'll get into in our next episode. Yeah. There is a competition mm. that has uh, all the rugby league experts, all of their tips are brought together. Yeah. We'll mention that next. We'll, we'll, next we're going to talk about that one in the next episode. Mm-hmm. Um, and yours truly, I mean, I've, I'm in 18th place. Are you in 18th place on this one? Yeah, with 22. Ah, you're giving this, everyone this a head start. That, well, I've, I've, had my, uh, I've had my good moment. <laughs> good moment. Everyone's catching up to me now because I'm going down. I'd just like to point out that my total, my total margin is 69. Just quietly. Yeah. Mine's 82. <laughs> Last week, mine was the highest. And now, because I tipped South to win by 40 and they won by 38, it's it's not as high anymore. Yeah, we did I do 40 or 38? I feel like I did 38 too. You probably did something, something good and impressive. No, I think I picked 40 and the margin was 38. Well, isn't that what we both did? I think so. I know yeah. I did that. Yeah, yeah, that's what we did. Yeah, yeah. Um... Oh, we've had a review. Yes, tell us the review. Yes, this is from uh, Grand Wizard seven 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 seven, and he's he's uh, given these reviews the heading throbbers. Well, he's nailed us in one. <laughs> nailed it. I said best rugby league analysis podcast there is. Keep up the good work. So uh, we will. How can you argue with a Grand Wizard? Green Wizard seven 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 seven. We promise to continue the work. Yeah, it would have been good if you had to use seven sevens, and you actually use six sevens. So, ah, don't know what that's about. Yeah, all M sevens. I wonder what yeah. the deal is there. That's it a lot of Green Wizards. I hope it doesn't mean something. Does that mean there's seven hundred seventy-seven thousand seven hundred seventy-six previous Green Wizards? I don't know. That's a lot. It's... Uh, it feels like some Harry Potter shit. Yeah, I I can't do Harry Potter. <laughs> I, no, same here. I, I remember years ago, I was like, okay, let's watch his first movie. And I got about 15 minutes into it, and I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Hey, at least you got that far. I, I think I got about 10 minutes into it and went to sleep. Yeah. I've tried to watch the first Harry Potter film three times, and I constantly fall asleep. At some stage, just you know, just about as he's starting to fly around on a broom or some shit. When they, so, you know, when they start talking about that game they play on the brooms, yeah, and like they take it's like a twenty minute lesson on how to play this fucking sport, <laughs> and then they get to the end of it and they go, "Oh yeah, but if you catch this thing, none of it matters, and the game's over and you win." And it's like, well, can you fucking lead with that next time? Because and like Harry, do his credit, is like, well, fuck all this other shit. 
I'm just going after the fucking gold ball thing. The <laughs> wings. It's uh, like fucking hell, man. We do run the risk of that's what Peter Valenis is trying to turn rugby league into. Ah, uh, you, you know, give it five more weeks. We'll have like it. We'll have twenty-five man teams. It'll be the National a, Quidditch a, League. Yeah, the Quidditch competition. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone must have a broom. Paint the ball gold. Seriously. And still, still fuck all substitutions. Yeah, it'll be good. Oh boy. Anyway, so that that's good. We've got that review out of the way. That's a, that's a classic one. We'll pop that one up on the website. When I say we, I mean Freaky Bull. One hundred percent. I don't do website stuff. You... <laughs> yeah, you, you know what? You're pretty crappy when it comes to websites, Andrew. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I make sure everyone else sets them all up and makes them all absolutely stupid proof, <laughs> and then I can start working on it. That's the way to be. Um, if somebody was going to contribute to the digitization of rugby league history, what would be the best way to go about that? In my personal opinion? Yes. For my personal benefit? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you go to patreon.com slash RL project. Mm-hmm. I had to remember what it was then. Um, yeah, you can go on there and make a donation from as little as a dollar a month. That's it. And nice. that would be, that's heaps. Um, and that money's being used to, you know, obviously the upkeep of the website. And if you haven't seen yet, if you go to the website on the homepage, you'll see our uh, 2020 Rugby League Annual. Mm-hmm. That is basically a teaser for what the overall plan for the annual is, which you'll probably see with any luck this year, the end of this year for the 2021 annual. Um, And so that thing isn't free to put together either. So the Patreon money goes towards paying for that as well. Um, So yeah, I I pay for those out of my, out of the Patreon money so -hmm. that you all can get something free. Nice. It's, it's kind of free if you donate money. You yeah, know, that all helps. Yeah, and it's just if you can afford to. Yeah, and it's essentially it's it's a twofold thing. It's about you know, obviously looking back on the year that was, while also promoting as many unique, independent content creators in the rugby league space, especially yeah. analysts and stuff like that, because you know yeah. a lot of them do use the the data we've got at rugby league projects. So I, I like to see you know, how they can use what we've got there. And yeah, it's, I just see numbers and go, oh, let's do basic stats. And they all do this other fancy shit like, you know, Harry Potter wizardry and look at it going, how the fuck did they do that? <laughs> do I know. It's amazing stuff though. So, uh, yeah, get in there and support us. That'd be fantastic. And while you're at it and you've got the old card out, make sure you head over to patreon.com slash league freak. And what can they do over there, freak? Well, if you can get a bunch of merch, if you're a member for three months at different levels, you can, uh, I think that at the level start, at, I think they're bumped down now to one Australian dollar a month is the lowest level now, which is pretty handy. Um, and everything goes towards my website costs, uh, any costs associated from my side of the podcast, because me and Andrew cut uh, go 50-50 with all the costs of the podcast. Um, you know, and just this week, I have had to pay for this, uh, the superleaguewar.com, superleaguewar.com, and salfordreddevils.co.uk. That's all just this week. So there's a lot of websites and stuff I've got to pay for. And then I've also got the Rugby League Podcasting Network. Check that one out. That's pretty handy, that one. NRL Breaking News, which is just a news accumulation website. But it's somewhere you can see the headlines all quickly and stuff like that. Obviously, leaguefreak.com, which is the main website of mine. And, yeah, so it all goes towards that. Um, and any any time I want to, you know, I've got to buy a, you know, the microphone, I mean, well, how much was the microphone when I got this? Do you remember? It was like, was it 280 or something? 200? It's a fit whack. Yeah, it was a whack, this one. This was like the level, the next level up from these microphones was like the $700 level. And I think we'd only been, we'd done like 40 podcasts at that point because my blue ball broke pretty quickly, unfortunately. 
That does happen with blue balls. Yeah, you know, eventually they just explode. So, um, so and I've got a really good microphone now, which is good. So, and I've got my microphone swing arm and things like that. It all just goes towards that. So, if you feel like contributing, if you enjoy the content that uh, that you get out of, I guess, my side of Fergo and the Freak, and give me Andrew's money too. <laughs> well, there you go. You know. <laughs> Why not? Get in on it, people. That's so fucked up. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's been mentioned before, but yeah. um, when you go to the the Rugby Project one, yeah. make sure you write the word project when you get to the RL part. Oh, yeah. And uh, don't just stop at RLP yeah. if you're at work. It's not suitable for work if you just go to slash RLP. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're write, contributing write, to RLP every month. We're yeah, like, gotta, we like what they do, but still. Yeah. I, I fear that a lot of the money that I was probably supposed to get came from people who went to, uh, Andrew, you know, <laughs> they went to patreon.com slash RLP and went, oh, I'll just go here instead. That's funny. There you go. I There's hope that that yeah. happened, hey. Yeah, that's something that people can look into now. You know, the thing that you also put out some content on uh, your Patreon, don't you? Um, not often. As, yeah, but you do do as, as I've said with you before, um, off air, I am the absolute worst person when it comes to promoting shit I do. Yeah. Um, I have, to, and this is no word of a lie. I have to be reminded by Freaky every time we put out a podcast. Can you retweet it, please? Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, 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 I could do that. You see me? I, I don't put much stuff out. I, I barely use the Patreon page. I don't put much stuff up on the uh, the RLP Twitter account. I don't mention it when I put stats up half the time. Mm. I'm just shit at this. <laughs> See, I you know the way I think about the Patreon page, and I'm pretty sure this is how it works for for my Patreon page anyway, because I know yours is very different. But I feel as though everyone that contributes to my Patreon page listens to the podcast, so I know I can speak on the podcast and talk to those people. But, like, you've got so many people that use your Patreon page and contribute to your Patreon page because of Rugby League Project as well. So it, it, it's funny how, like, we both have Patreon, but it's almost like there's the – you've well, like, you've got two split audiences for your Patreon. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's – um, I, I should be – I should be doing a lot more on it. <laughs> I'm just hopeless at it. Yeah. I've got Facebook pages for the podcast and for Rugby League Project. I don't remember the last time I logged in on them. This is why I need an intern. <laughs> I'm just thinking, this is the worst way to sell your Patreon page ever, Andrew. What are you doing? I, I figure if I put out the um, pity me approach, it might work. <laughs> after you after you went with the violence approach in the last two episodes, I'm going to try the pity approach. I tried threats. Did you get any new Patreons for the threats? No. No, I lost one. Oh, did you? Oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> that was because of you, though. <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> um, I look, the good thing with Patreon, too, is if at any time you go, you know what, I can't afford it this month, you can just stop it and come yeah. back when you can afford it again. Yeah. It's a great thing like that. So, yeah, get in there and help us out. That'd be fantastic. That'd be awesome. I'll have to ask again, is there anything else? <laughs> Um, no, that's it. It's been a good episode. A lot of different subjects that we've covered. We have indeed. Yeah, rest uh, in peace, Tommy. We love you. Absolutely. Vale, Tommy. Cattle dog.